Hello and welcome everybody uh, to, the, to today's fireside chat on empowering travel for all. I'm Julia Charlton, Chair of the Commonwealth Chamber, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. So travel, you might think, is a fundamental human right, certainly a great pleasure for most, yet many groups face barriers that restrict their ability to explore the world. Simon Sansom founded Snowball with the mission of breaking down these barriers, bringing together a community to make travel more inclusive. So it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest, Simon Sansom, who's also a journalist, disability rights advocate and founder of the impactful Facebook page, Ability Access. As we'll hear more about later, at just 32 years of age, Simon's life took an unexpected turn when a tragic injury left him disabled from the waist down. Rather than let this define him, Simon returned to university to study journalism and channel his experience into empowering others. In 2016, while attending De Montfort University, Simon created the Ability Access Facebook page. His goal was simple, raise awareness about disability access issues. And the page quickly exploded into a global phenomenon. What began as a local initiative soon snowballed into the most read disability page worldwide, showing the power of social media for driving change and empowering connectivity. Since then, Simon has earned numerous honors for his advocacy, including the prestigious Jesse Jackson Prize. He's expanded his work through a blog, a hit podcast called Wild Disabled, and several TV and radio programs focused on disability topics. His Snowball app won the Digital and Tech Award at the Disability Power 100 Awards and the Santander X National Award for empowering people with disabilities through technology and community building. Today, Simon's going to share more on Snowball's origin, story, how the community operates and his vision for creating a future where everyone can experience the personal growth, cultural exchange and human connection that travel facilitates. We'll also discuss the particular challenges of travellers with disabilities and how improved accessibility benefits us all. Nearly one in five people globally live with some form of disability. So this is an enormous market um, to be explored by everybody who would like to see more of the world. I'm looking forward to an inspiring conversation on how we can work together to break down barriers, open opportunities and empower travel for everybody. And with that, let's give a warm welcome to Simon Sansom. Simon, over to you to hear an overview from you. you about what you've been doing. Thank you, Thank you very much for that introduction. Wow, that sounds like a lot's been going on, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, uh, thank you for the honour and let me come and talk to everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, I think we're going to start off with a little small presentation. And what this is, this is the Snowball Community app, which is available on Apple and Android. So I highly recommend you download it. It is available anywhere in the world. And um, I don't have control of the slides, so I'm going to jump into it if that's okay. Uh, so yeah, Snowball, what is it? It's a global disability app. It's the largest disability app in the world. Um, it's a review platform for disabled access, and but it also, more importantly, directs you to your destination. I'll explain why that's really important as well later. Um, it's also the biggest disability database in the world for government of businesses uh, for infrastructure and changes to the communities. And in its first, just over the first year, we had almost 40,000 reviews. So it's doing really well. And we're hoping to more than double that this year. The easiest way to explain it is TripAdvisor for the disabled community. That's probably the easiest open description of it. So again, uh, Julie's explained some of this. So how did it start? Um, I became disabled in 2014 after a chiropractor crushed my spine. I set up uh, the Ability to Access Facebook page. It's now been rebranded Snowball Community. Um, we've got about, give or take, 110,000 followers on social media, so it does all right. Um, that accidentally became the most disability, most read disability page in the world in 2019. And as Julie explained, it won the Digital Tech Award at the Disability Power 100 and the Santander Awards as well. And this is just a brief stat of like what we get each month um, from uh, viewers and visits to our page so it does really well um oh yeah so um i was also named in the top 10 of the most influential people in the uk yay me um but what i want to show is, is the growth of uh, how snowball has uh, 
expanded and exploded over the past year. Um, so this was the first pitch is of London six weeks after the launch. I think there's about 20 to 40 reviews there, give or take. And then you can see how it, it impacted London. The red dots are, you know, one of the red dots has 789 alone uh, in that space, in that area of London. So uh, the red dots are with mass reviews. And then the blue ones, I think, are under 10 uh, in the area. So, yes. So how does it work? Uh, it's quite simple. You go onto Apple and Android. You download the app, you register, and you type in where you want to go. And remember, this is global. Um, so anyway, it can be used anywhere in the world. And if it's not on there, you simply add the place as well. So at the moment, we are primarily getting most of our reviews from the UK. We do have places. Actually, I found out, I found out yesterday we do have three places in Hong Kong, uh, which include Disneyland, Victoria Peak, um, and a temple which I can't pronounce, so I do apologize. Um, but we also have places in Dubai. New York is starting to take off. I think we've got about 20 or 30 in New York, um, uh, a few in Canada. Australia, we've got quite a few. Um, so it is growing worldwide, but it's just going to take a bit of time because we are primarily based in the UK at the moment, but we are looking to expand because we are supported by Google Maps. So how it works is when you download the app, um, you select your location and where you want to go. You can select it by category as well, whether it's a pub or a restaurant or a toilet, whatever you might need. And it will direct you using uh, Google SatNav uh, from anywhere in the world, um, which is quite cool. So if you're in the center of London and you're a visitor or you're a tourist and you have a disability, or even if you don't have a disability and you need a toilet, it will direct you to a local toilet, okay? If you need uh, a, a safe space or somewhere quiet, it will direct you to there as well. It's to make you inclusive, if you want to go on a tourist destination trip, um, you can see the review uh, of what people have left before you visit that place. So that's why I call it TripAdvisor for the disabled community. So you're not left stranded, not knowing where to go, where to access. You can have a full fun day out knowing you will not be turned away. And that's why uh, it's doing quite well. Um, so this is this bit is kind of interesting. We um, <laughs> we put out an advert just yesterday, actually, to take on 70 new, 70 new members of staff uh, for the Snowball app. And this is the reason why. Um, we're launching a national uh, membership scheme, which uh, a number of governments are interested in taking this on, and a lot of big businesses. And this, this is something that hasn't been introduced before to the UK or anywhere in the world. Um, and what it is, it's a membership scheme for Snowball app where so Snowball assessors will visit your business. It's a membership scheme. So you sign up for the membership scheme and we will visit your business and place of work and give you a disability consultation on how good or how bad your access is. And what we will do, we will work with you to improve access wherever possible. And if anyone's got more complicated needs, they'll be able to see the full report online as well. Um, so you this might this might include braille menus hearing loops automatic doors disabled toilets but also things like for people with mental health issues and learning disabilities um so for example if you go to the natural history museum in london it can be quite rowdy it you know you get a lot of school kids there it's quite impactful and can have an issue on your sensory issues if you've got autism or something along those lines um however if you go to the national library you know it's going to be quite quiet you know you're going to have a safe space and uh, so it's it's providing a idea of where you can go where it's not going to be too impactful on your senses if you're oversensitive or have a diagnosis of a mental health issue or a learning disability. And we call that a stimulation rating. Um, and then obviously the access rating is for anyone who has a wheelchair issue or limited mobility. And we say how good or bad that access is as well. And these are going to be window stickers and businesses can promote these as much as they like over the course of the year. And then renew on the second year. And then they get a big certificate as well. They can stick behind the bar or the pub or advertise online wherever. So this is uh, this is moving forward. We've got dozens of businesses waiting to sign up to this and already, already wanted to register. Uh, and we're moving along this in the next few months very quickly. So looking forward to that. Um, this is just an idea of who our audience is. Um, this was for a presentation with the Santander. I had to, uh, we had um, a, a musician called Tiny Tempo who's very big in the UK. And so I put music venues at the top there because it's, you know, he did a lot of promotion on music venues a couple of years ago on disabled access. And one of the other judges was an Olympian. So I put Paralympics and Olympics and, you know, send parents, family members, disabled community, restaurants, cafes, universities. So I was trying to target my, um, Present the Santander presentation um, to the, the judges who were going to make the final decision if I won or not, which I did. So I think that kind of worked. So that's why that slide's there. Uh, so this is where a lot of people are interested in this, especially Google. Um, so I had a meeting with Google a few months ago, and they said, we are collecting data they simply can't 
uh, collect. It's just impossible for them to do so. And so it's called the Purple Pound. And what the Purple Pound is, is what the what people with disabilities spend to the is worth to the UK economy at the moment is worth two hundred seventy four billion pound a year, and that goes up each year by about four or five percent. And the data we're collecting is to help communities and businesses be more inclusive because they are losing out on hundreds of millions of pounds each month. It's estimated just in the um, pub restaurant industry alone, in the in the hospitality industry, you're looking at losing 190 million pound a month just from not being able to cater for the disabled community. So we gave a statistic between Loughborough and Syston. These are two towns in Leicestershire in England. And what it is, is we had, it's called snowballing. And what they do is they go out and leave a review on where's accessible and where's not. And they added places to the Snowball app. And we had a number of volunteers who spent half a day doing this. And they said that they, they snowballed every single shop in the village and every single uh, cafe shop and high street shop in the towns. And these towns are similar. Loughborough's a bit bigger because it has a university, but both of them have supermarkets, both of them have a train station, uh, both of them have big communities. And Syston only had one in four one in four places that were accessible for the disabled community, where Loughborough had almost half. So the data for this is extremely sellable. It's extremely profitable because right move are interested in this because if you and so are councils, we're having meeting with councils all the time now. Because if you're investing a 500 million pound housing development in the area, you're not going to build it near Syston because why would you build it where you can't improve the quality of life for people, especially if the older generation is getting on a bit? Um, you'd build it towards Loughborough because you know they can have a better quality of life, access more and get out more and spend more in the local community, which obviously put coffers and employs people in. So it, it boosts the local economy. And that's why a lot of people are really interested in this at the moment, because as Google said, we are collecting data they simply can't collect because we're in the front door. Uh, this is just going to be to tell you a bit brief of how we're going to commercialize it. Uh, membership schemes, which is which is launching. We're already doing advertising. We can going to do a subscription service, uh, promoting to businesses in the area, and then promotion on like Messenger and YouTube and things like that. Um, we're also going to target people as well and say, if you're in the area, have you tried this place as well? Um, businesses will be able to put their places at the top of the page as well, but not under, but under the assessment. And then we start selling data. Uh, to businesses uh we're not we won't be selling personal information we would never do that we would be selling data we collected by people who have left reviews on the app to show how accessible and how not and it just and there was what we were speaking to hinkley and bosworth council i'm just going to come back to the data for a second um and what was really interesting is they've got the uh, battle of hastings field and it's a worldwide site uh which is only up the road from where we are and what was interesting is, is they had roughly about the same access levels as Loughborough at 48%. But when they when Snowball asked them, would they return, 28% of people said no, because they had a bad experience gaining access to the town. And it just and one one of one of the simple things which I spoke to Hinkley and Bosworth about a little while ago is there's a car park in a council car park, and it says blue badge parking is completely free of charge. Okay, and that's great. However, in that car park, there was no disabled bays. So when I went to park there, I had to cover two parking spaces. Uh, and it's just little things like that, which is going to give someone a bad experience. And they know, now I'm not going to go back to that car park because I don't want a, a sign on my windscreen saying, you know, you bad park, you, you badly parked uh, with a blue badge. Um, and it's just little things like that, which will stop me going from the town centre now to maybe going somewhere else. So it's just the little things that could improve. And I go into town and I buy a lunch, I'll have a drink, have a cup of tea, buy, I go to the visit shops. And so that town itself is losing out on hundreds of pounds a year because of a simple car park issue. So that's just one example. Um, so when I was doing the, doing the national awards for the Santander Awards, um, the global awards, which I'm now going to, were in Barcelona. I didn't know I'd won at this point. And so I was standing on stage saying, well, if I do win and I get to go to Barcelona for the Santander Global Awards, I know where I can stay. I know where I can visit. I know where I can go for a day out because there are 185 reviews in Barcelona uh, on, on the app showing me where's accessible and where's not. So I think that went down a treat showing that I can have a nice time in Barcelona without really worrying about where the local toilet is, uh, how to do, you know, uh, where I can stay and where I can visit without getting turned away. So I think that helped tremendously. 
Fantastic, Simon. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to um, perhaps extending this all over Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong is um, a very hilly place. So I think some of these um, accessibility issues are quite challenging, but it uh, be interesting to see how much Hong Kong can meet them to improve tourism yeah. in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fantastic. I did have a look and there is, I, before the meeting, I did have a look and you do actually have a taxi service for disabled people in Hong Kong as well. Yes, we do. And uh, yeah, I did download your app. So, you know, we can start to start getting going with that. Yeah. yeah, cool. So it's wonderful to hear so much about Snowball and how exciting it is. But I think a lot of people might be interested to know more about yourself and your life, um, yeah. both before and after your injury and, and what yeah. brought you to the on your journey to where you are now. Yeah. Um, so before my injury, I was working for uh, Leicester City Council in social services, uh, where we provide assistance for people with adult mental health and physical disabilities. Um, I was also a local politician for my sins. Um, I, I was a local councillor for about five minutes. I stood for parliament twice, uh, failed twice. Um, and that was an experience. And, you know, I, I was playing badminton each week, three times a week, I was swimming most mornings. I used to play a bit of rugby. Um, and I was a fully functioning, very active person uh, before my injury. Uh, I, was, I, was, I liked working in the community. I liked to help supporting people. And the services, I, I'd done thousands of assessments with uh, social services. And the services that I was providing, I actually needed, which was weird. Um, and then uh, in 2014, I had a slip disc. And we weren't too sure how I caused the slip disc. I've had slip discs before. Uh, and they are um, as people who've had them. They are very painful. Okay. Yeah. Um, and but however, you move around. You take some ibuprofen. You do your exercises. For me, because I was going away on my honeymoon, because um, we just got married, I wanted to get my slip disc sorted before I went away on our honeymoon because we we're going to Mexico. And so I went to see a chiropractor for the first time. And for the first few sessions, it was working really well. But on the about the I can't remember if it was the fifth or sixth one, she was because it was like a week and a half away from Mexico. She started to really push my spine and try and manipulate the disc back in. And on that occasion, I screamed really loudly, yeah. and she crushed my spine. Um, I didn't know what the damage was at the time um, because I I was in so much pain. I got up and walked out. <laughs> yeah, Kate, my Kate, my wife was waiting for me outside. And I collapsed in the car. And uh, the following morning, uh, I went to bed and said, look, this is, I don't know what's going on, but this really hurts. This isn't right. And I'll scream and I managed to get into bed. And <laughs> the following morning, it was the most bizarre situation you can imagine. It's the first time in my life I had left uh, my phone downstairs. Um, and we lived in a cul-de-sac. So nobody could hear us next door or anything. And I woke up and I had no sensation for the waist down. I thought I had a stroke. Um... And it is the most bizarre situation you've ever been in because you're like, what's going on? Am I live kind of thing? And yeah, my legs weren't working. My legs weren't moving. Anything from the waist down wasn't working. I couldn't toilet. And Kate had already left for work. Uh, she left, she leaves quite early. Um, I was off work anyway because I had a slip disc. So I was, you know, I was sleeping in. And uh, I didn't know what to do. So I was screaming there for about, I was, I was good, a couple of hours. Uh, I was there like wondering what am I going to do? And I said, if I don't get up, I could potentially die uh, because I had no idea what happened. Something has clearly gone wrong. Um, so there's a good video on the film for this as well because um, it, it's quite accurate. I threw myself out of bed, did an arm crawl to the stairs, um, threw myself down the stairs head first because I couldn't turn my body around, uh, which is extremely dangerous. Uh, trying to, I was trying to do it one arm at a time. And my arms just went. And so I went all the way down on the stairs, butt naked, <laughs> all the way down. Managed to get a phone and then called for help. Um, I don't remember a lot after that because I was under a lot of drugs very quickly. Um, yeah, I don't remember the ambulance coming because I was in so much pain. I don't remember going to hospital. I don't remember the next few days really that well. But over the next course of the few months, um, I was in hospital for months and um, not moving. I got told I would never sit up again. Um, and we're supposed to be going on our on honeymoon, um, which wasn't going to happen Oh, so it this is a few weeks after we just got married so that was very interesting um and it took a year of recovery it did um so physio um, um exercises you name it i did it uh, a couple of operations 
But one of, one of the worst things was it, when I was in hospital, and we didn't know this for a couple of years, actually, um, it was actually misdiagnosed uh, when I was sent to hospital. So I've got something called cordiaquinia syndrome, um, which is spinal damage for you and me, and it's extremely common. Um, four people in the UK are diagnosed with it every day. It's It can paralyze you from the waist down like it's done with me. Mine's one of the worst case scenarios. However, if you get a operation to reduce the swelling within 24 hours to 48 hours, then it's fully recoverable. So this is vitally important. And for whatever reason, it was misdiagnosed. They should have done the operation. They didn't do the operation. And by the time three months ago, by in hospital, uh, um, not knowing what to do with me, the damage had already been done. There wasn't any recovery from that. Um, and yeah, so, uh, and after that, went home, lived downstairs, had carers, um, not knowing what was going on at work. That will, I think we're going to come to that later. Um, and it was a harrowing experience. And I just didn't know what to do with myself. It was, I couldn't work. I didn't know if I could go back to work. Um, and, you know, and the first time we went out after a year, we went to our favorite restaurant um, in Leicester. And like, like probably the most people who are watching this have never paid any attention to disabled access before, even though I worked in social services and I knew a little bit about it. Until you're in the chair, you know nothing and you don't pay any attention to it at all. It's just one of those things you just ignore. Um, and it isn't until you actually need that service, you start paying a lot of attention to it. So we went to our rest favorite restaurant. There was a step to get in. There were people in front of the disabled door access. You couldn't get through. There was another door inside, which I couldn't get in because my wheelchair was too wide. Uh, we had to disturb people uh, when they were eating their meals. I was on show when I was trying to get in the restaurant. And when I asked to go to the toilet, uh, it was upstairs. Uh, the disabled toilet was on the first floor, which was, oh. So I ended up peeing myself in the restaurant. Um, and we left pretty much in tears in the restaurant. Meal was nice, but we left in tears. <laughs> and um, I said, this can't continue. And that's when I started the Facebook page, Ability Access. It's now we've been, been rebranded Snowball Community. And it wasn't supposed to be anything. It wasn't, you know, all I wanted to do was to raise awareness of disabled access in the Leicester area. That was it. However, everyone else had different ideas. Um, and within you know a month, it had a fifteen hundred followers. After two months, it had three thousand. And yeah, if you look at it now, it's about at about one hundred ten thousand on social media. So it grew considerably um, quite quickly, um, and it started winning a lot of awards. And that's where we are now. Yeah. You yeah. know, one thing I is one of the great things about you, Simon, is that you know you know you never talk about yourself for long. You're always back on to what you're doing and what you're doing for the app and for other people. <laughs> So I do I, I, want to I, ask you another question along the lines of yourself. So what aspects of your life before this happened do you think gave you the sort of strength to empower you to take such a positive approach after what most people perhaps would, you know, regard as life ending almost? Um, and you've I, taken I, such a positive I, approach to everything. Yeah, I I've always said that I've always wanted to help people. So working for social services, working for the council, I I mean, uh, my mum wanted me to join the army. I wasn't keen on joining the army. Um, I got I went down to the recruitment centre because I've i got uh, I've got very good marksmanship skills. Um, I've got very good coordination. And they said, do you want to travel the world? I went, yes. Do you want, and I go, do you want to join the army? I went, no. He goes, why? Because I don't want to kill people. Um, and... I, I've always had a sense of duty and trying to help people and try to be nice and try to be open. And it's never about me. It's, I, th I think this is where, when I was in hospital and when I was a social worker, I've seen people at their most dire situation. I mean, I've seen people with their legs falling off. I've seen people with their houses with rubbish up to the ceiling, you know, sectioning people. It's not nice. It's so wh whatever happens to you where and where I am now, and this is, OK, there are so many pe people worse off than you. And I'll give you an example of this is when because Kate, my wife, came to visit me every day for months in hospital and she had to walk by the brain injury unit. OK, and you see people there with half a head, mm -hmm. um, you know, half their school missing. You mm -hmm. see them with severe mental health issues. You see, you know, and uh, they are in a vegetable state. And so while I got told I would never sit up again, OK, um, it's more of. Okay, let's cope with that. Okay, what 
can I do from bed? I can write, I can read, I can, you know, okay. I've got nephews and nieces. My wife keeps me going. I've got a, quite a large family and I'm very close to them. And I think that's what keeps me going and why I want to do good for them. Um, and I just think it's never about me. It's always about what you can do for other people. And I'm now in a very privileged situation where I am financially secure for life. But let's try and improve that. Let's try and use that to encourage other people to help get out, improve their quality of life, if that makes any sense. No, and I'm and sure that's... you're a great inspiration to, to many, and uh, especially your uh, nieces and nephews, I would imagine. Yeah, what a great uncle to have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I am the fun uncle who takes them out for stuff and, you know, treat them to stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. And when I'm listening to all these access problems, it, the only real experience I've ever encountered anything remotely similar was having small children in one of them in the pushchair or, you know, two very small children and three at times in Hong Kong and re suddenly realizing how you see the world so differently when you can't yeah. get around easily. And how unhelpful people some people can be and how helpful other people can be i mean it's a massive contrast yeah. some of the time isn't it i'll tell you a story what happened to us a few weeks ago in london uh we had to go we tra I traveled down to london a lot for work and we booked a hotel and we booked obviously the accessible room it's got a rolling shower fantastic that's what we need okay got to the hotel and it's got eight steps at the front door are going up so it's you know quite steep steps yes. and we're like oh Crikey. Okay. How do we get in? So Kate goes in uh, because there's no call button either. You can't call anyone to come down to reception. Uh, uh, so to come down outside. Um, so we, so they go, okay, so we'll take you through the back entrance. I thought, great, we'll get this sorted. So because it's in central London, the back entrance was like a 10 minute walk. Cause you had to go all around all the shops yeah. in the building street and stuff. Um, so we got around to the back entrance and there's two steps there at the back entrance. And I'm like, can you not manage those two steps? And I'm like, well, no, I can't walk. So what he what they suggested was there was a construction company who were working behind the hotel, and they suggested they can get these long planks, you know, the boards, and so I can go. I said, yeah, but what am I going to do if I want to get out of the hotel? He goes, I can't call you over every time. Um, and I go, why have you got an accessible room with a rolling shower, but you've got no disabled access to actually physically get in the hotel? And I went, oh, we never thought of that. Shocker. Um, so therefore, I, I forced the hotel company to find me alternative accommodation because I said, I'm not looking for alternative accommodation. You're the one who's messed this up. You're the one who's not advertised it properly. Um, and you're going to find me accommodation. And they did. They put us in a taxi and sent us to another hotel a couple of miles away. Um, but th but that's, that's a regular thing. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's not anything vindictive. It's just thoughtlessness, isn't it? Failing yeah, it's just it it's inexperience. That's yeah. what it is. It's inexperience and lack of awareness. It's suddenly seeing the world through someone else's eyes. Yeah. yeah. And again, I mean, I've got certificates from adult mental health and learning disabilities coming out of my ears uh, from Leicester City Council on the training courses that I went on. But again, until you're in the chair, what you know is uncountable. Yes. And what you don't know, yeah. Yes. Yes. So there's a wonderful film, a documentary that features you and um, some of this story. Yeah. So can you tell us how that happened and, yeah, and how I, people can this, watch it? Because it's actually a very inspiring story as well as being a very sad story. Yeah, this is really weird. Um, this was this was not expected at all um so uh i uh, years ago i i love writing um i i've got a few things published on amazon and uh i wrote a comic book called three blind mice it's a story about three disabled people who have uh different disabilities taking on monsters and demons in leicestershire after richard the third was found under under uh, under under the social workers car parking space um and you know it did it did okay um, it is available to buy on amazon uh it's called three blind mice and it's a fun comic book it's stupid okay it's it, you know it's ridiculous um so i did my best to try and sell that to a number of production companies and i had a few meetings meetings uh i got i didn't really get very far one of the production companies i went to meet was called brandy studios they were based in bournemouth and i met a person called charlotte fantelli who owns the company still owns the company and uh, I told her about Three Blind Mice. We had a meeting about it. And then she said, and I told her what happened to me. Mm. And um, she said, I'm not going to do Three Blind Mice. We're going to make a documentary about yourself. <laughs> and I went, no. <laughs> I went, it's not about me. And 
uh, yeah, <laughs> I was uh, originally I wasn't keen on the idea. Kate, my wife, certainly wasn't keen on the idea. Uh, but after a while, we started talking about it. And went, okay, we'll do this to raise awareness of cordiaquina syndrome, to raise awareness of disabled access, um, to promote awareness of disability everywhere. Um, so that was the intention of the film. Um, and so we started filming it. Um, we had to come back to it. We did a lot of it, and then it got locked down because of uh, COVID. And then yeah. we had to come back to it a year later, so it got delayed. It was supposed to be a feature film, and then we, because uh, because of COVID, we ch then changed it into a documentary. Mm. Okay, um, and it started. Well, yeah, we we didn't think anything. We thought it, we had a big prem we had a premiere in London, which was great fun. Uh, celebrities turned up. Um, that was a bit weird. And it was a good night. You know, it was received exceptionally well. And then we entered into a number of awards and it won quite a few awards. It won 16 international film awards. And then I was, we, me and Kate were driving home one night and we got a call from Charlotte saying, um, you might want to sit down for this because Amazon Prime have just brought it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> Um, so no, it was it, it's done reasonably well, and it's still doing reasonably well. I think you still got to buy it at the moment, uh, but that's because people are still buying it, and that's you know they turn it, they put it on for free of charge under the subscription service. But I think while people are still buying it, um, yeah, they're not going to do that at the moment. So it's on Amazon Prime. It's called Access All Areas. It's won lots of awards, um, and that's that's pretty much how it came across. And we've done uh, lots of it. We helped raise. Um, we helped Oxford University, the A and E department, raise 1.4 million into um, uh, getting a grant for, uh, for the first research into cordiaquina syndrome uh, aftercare as well. And uh, Dr. David Metcalf, who's from Oxford Uni, actually appears in it and, yes, and says yes, back, talks about cordiaquina syndrome. Yeah, so, yeah. no, it's uh, I mean it's great on, on multiple levels, um, and not least because of the awareness that it creates, doesn't it? And it's you know that's going to yes. be a lasting. Yeah. testament that can be built upon i would think it's great really yeah. wonderful and yeah. i would suggest everybody watches it <laughs> thank you <laughs> so tell us more about um snowball and you know we heard an overview of it and how it connects well yeah. it's about travelers but it's not only about travelers really is it in the sense that it could be about travelers who are going anywhere in the world but it could also be just about improving where you live, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a both, really. I mean, in the UK, uh, we've got every roadside blue badge bay on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I, whether we're on the train, mainly we do drive down to London quite a lot, or if we go to a new town centre or something, to find a blue badge bay can be quite difficult. Yeah. Well, you just put it into Snowball and it takes you directly there. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had to go to Birmingham for work and, you know, Driving around Birmingham City Centre, it's a big city centre. Yeah. So you put it in the sat nap, it takes you to that direct car parking space. Um, it, you know, it's not a live update; it doesn't tell you if the space is free, but most of the time yeah. they are. Um, but if, if you don't have that one, you just go to another one. Um, but it's, it so it helps you to get out and about. It makes your life a little bit easier. Um, and but yes, it's it's to all for local communities as well. It's vitally important as well. Because it tells you what shops you can get into. It's a, even if it's a corner shop, you know, or the local fishmongers or something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the local bakery. It's it just tells you what you can get in and out of if you've never been there before, or you're a regular visitor and you've got family and friends coming over. But also to improve the quality of life for a lot of people, because nobody wants to go to a coffee shop not realizing they can't get in. No, and most um, coffee shops don't want to create that situation either, do they? You yeah. know, they then and it would help them to actually make by making them much more aware of what's yeah. actually needed. I mean, I mean, if you go, I mean, if I go to a coffee shop and I spend fifteen quid on breakfast, um, then it, you know, if it costs seventy five quid for a ramp and it, and I, then I can get in, then that seventy five quid is well worth it because I'm going to go back to that place over and over again for the next ten years. So they're going, and I won't be the only person who will go there. So it's a good investment, and it could be a simple thing as a ramp off Amazon. You just buy it, click on it, gets delivered, and you put out a portable ramp for someone. It could be that simple where it improves profitability for you very quickly. Um, one of the things I suggested with Santander is as well, because they're hoping to come onto the membership scheme, is for banks and building societies. And it's just like we can because of the membership scheme, we can um say which banks and are accessible 
people and which ones are not. And if they're not the same, then we can improve them. So if, like, I don't know, 250 Santander banks don't have hearing loops, and we can tell you which ones do need hearing loops. So it's just about being open to community because obviously people with disabilities and mental health issues still want to go into the banks and have a bank account and live their normal lives. And, yeah, it's about being businesses being responsible for their customers. Yes, although I suppose there's fewer and fewer bank branches for everybody, aren't there? Yeah, but there are still quite a lot. I mean, there's about, I think there's about 500 at Santander in the UK. I think there's HSBC have a good few hundred. So there are still quite yeah, a lot around. I think it's smaller villages. In some of the villages, yes. Yeah, it's just smaller villages where there aren't any. So, so what have been the biggest challenges you've faced to sort of trying to extend this and make travel and accessibility more inclusive? Uh, funds, uh, that has been an issue. Um, a lot. Of, I've invested a lot of my own personal money into this because there is a desperate need for it, and there isn't anything that it comes close to snowball anywhere in the world that I've seen. There are similar apps, but nothing that is quite as advanced as Snowball. Um, and it's, it's also the, the silliest things that you come across. Um, so, for example, I, I, um, I'll give you an example of this week. Actually, um, we, we put out an advert yesterday to take on seventy new seventy new staff across the UK, which I. So I explained earlier. And one of the issues is accessible office space. Okay. So we've been looking for accessible office space for myself and colleagues to have a small office. And there's nowhere. We can't find anywhere with an ex, you know. So this is how crazy it works in the UK. There is something called access to work. And this is a government funded program where they will make adaptations to your business premises or provide equipment for you to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. okay and it's i think it's don't quote myself but i think it's up to thirty thousand pounds they'll do adaptations for you so for me to go and say i want to rent a space in my local town or village to create an office for the key employees who've got about we're going to have about 10 um then i can't get in there on day one because it's not accessible so therefore i've got to apply for an application grant to get it adapted which can take anywhere up to 12 months <laughs> yeah then they've got to obviously do the adaptation and the works if we get the landlord's permission. Um, so therefore, I've got to pay out tens of thousands of pounds for an office I can't use even before I've worked there for one day, mm. um, which is just absolutely insane. And a lot of people we are employing have disabilities as well. And so, again, we come back to access to work and it takes up to six months for an assessment. So if I need to move the company on, I can't employ people because they might need a carer, they might need specialist equipment because they are severely disabled. And so getting the equipment and things in place for the dis disabled employees takes a lot longer than employing someone who is fully mobile, which is really ironic when you're trying to set up the biggest or have the biggest disability app in the world. It's um, It shouldn't be like that, but it is at the moment. And so, Do you and so think I'm, that's because right. there's a lot of government help with this? If it was more private sector driven, would it be faster? It would be, but I don't think the private sectors would feel like they need to pay out. I mean, for, here, so give you an example. If I wanted to give uh, people an electric wheelchair who I employ and they needed one for work, I my business certainly couldn't afford it at this time if we're employing 70 people and we need 70 wheelchairs. Um, so that's, so it depends. If if it's something like HSBC Sands and their big businesses who could afford to take on 10 employees and have the adaptation as done, yes, it would be a lot quicker, pray mm -hmm. privately. If companies like myself who don't have the funds to do it, um, then we have to go through access to work. But and then but you can also claim it back as well. Um, but I don't have the overheads to pay out for a lot of the equipment, first of all, especially carers as well. Um because obviously carers are, well, you know, if someone if someone needs to go out and do an assessment the, under the membership scheme with a carer, you know, uh, who is full time, it's taken as it's, it's another employee, and I certainly can't afford two people's wages um, on that scale. Uh, the funds just aren't there, so that's why. But you can claim it back for access to work eventually if they pay out. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah. It just strikes me that something down the road might be a more because um, I mean. The intention of that scheme is obviously very good. It's just it, it's yeah. somewhat mars it that everything is so slow, right? Because business, by definition, normally me needs to move quite quickly <laughs> to seize yeah. opportunities. You know. Yeah, I know. And when you've got to take when you want someone to start in two weeks' time after training, and then you say we can't take you on because you've got to wait six weeks for an assessment, six months for an assessment. 
hand. Um, it's a bit ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah. are you dealing with that through people working from home for the time being or how are you dealing with there isn't There isn't an easy way of doing it because we need people to access their communities uh, yeah. and people need help getting out and about. Yeah. Um, so there isn't an easy way of doing it. I've written to, I've written to Parliament, my MP. Um, I've written to uh, Tenny Gray Thompson, who's a member of the House of Lords, who's a friend who we've kind of worked with before. Um, and I've written to a few other people who might be able to give some advice and guidance on it. Uh, um, but we are struggling uh, to find not only office space um, for staff members and myself, um, we are struggling to employ people with disabilities because of the lack of support we get from government and co or corporations. And it's it, it's it's I was thinking about this the other night, and I was thinking if you think about it every, all over the world, if you think of billionaires, billionaire entrepreneurs. Okay, now I'm doing quite well, but I'm no nowhere near on a billionaire scale. Okay? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, um, the, you know, everyone can name a billionaire entrepreneur. They could probably name about five or six. You mm. couldn't name one disabled person who's made a billion quid. I suppose uh, how you define disabled. Yes, yes. Um, but, I mean, it's, if, it's, it's also represented in the House of Lords. There isn't, sorry, in the Houses of Parliament, there isn't one wheelchair user in the Houses of Parliament, and yet there's 650 seats in the Houses of Parliament, and one in, one in five people in the UK are disabled. It's not representative of the community. And that's when I, when I came back, as, a, as I explained earlier, I was a politician. One of the reasons I left that is, or I lost my seat, is because... I lost by 19 votes because I couldn't knock on doors. I mm. couldn't campaign. I couldn't I couldn't speak to people because I couldn't get out and about by myself um, after my injury. So that's why I never went back into that because the support wasn't there. So. Well, you probably get it now, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we are actually... Uh, so um, they did it for a short while. They did introduce something called the Access to Public Funds Office. Uh, the government did. But it was it wasn't for campaigning. It it was for uh, it was for public meetings. Um, so it gave a little bit of support, but not actually what you needed it for. Um, yeah. And they're trying to bring that back. There was a campaign to bring that back, but it, until it's reformed, it's pointless from my point of view. Right, right. Yeah. So have you seen what you're doing change attitudes? And you, do, you know, do you have any tangible examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> One of the best, the best one we got. I had a phone call with a, oh, I won't mention her name, um, and she's, she's got a severely disabled son who's in his twenties. Okay, and she cried down the phone at me and said, "I've been waiting for something like this all my life um, because he can't look after himself. He needs twenty-four hour care, and we end up going to the same place over and over again." Um, and she just said, with the blue badge bays, with the accessible toilet, with the hoist as well, because they've got toys, a hoist with to uh, toilets on there as well. Um, she said, it's made our lives so much easier. It means we can go to different places. She said, I've been to the library every day for 15 years. Um, they went to the same zoo every day for like 10 years. Mm. Um, and they just didn't know where. They were too frightened to go anywhere. Yes, um, I really understand um, that. Yeah. Uh, the other example is there's a theatre in Leicester, and we went and when we were trialing this a couple of years ago, we trialed this because I started. You have to remember, I started this like seven years ago. Mm. So we started trialing this in that year too. Um, we went to local business and said, "Would you mind me doing a free assessment for you?" And they went, "Yes, brilliant." So they went to the local theatre, and uh, I said, "Look, you've got you've got a toilet hoist, you've got disabled toilet." you've got you can have signers on stage you know it's, it's really good access nobody knows about it and one of the biggest things is on the back row on the center circle you could take out the last row so you could fit 50 wheelchairs in there okay and after that was highlighted and shared on social media they were inundated by charities wanting to come to the theater uh, to see shows to give people better experiences and that's you know that's just two examples of how we're improving lives giving people better experiences uh, people spending money in the local community and it you know this is just very two very simple examples of how snowball can improve quality of life for a lot of people yes yeah that's a wonderful example um i noticed on your sort of slide with all the different users um i didn't see any reference to religious places of worship like churches or mosques or anything and i just wondered uh, what, uh, what, what, what you had interface with yeah, 
Yeah, there is. Uh, it's under so uh, once you click the first one, it says rec- we put. Uh, I can't remember if it's under recreational activities. I think that's a bit of controversy under that. But then it says religious places. Yeah. Um, I I appeared on um, BBC Four's Yours and Yours a few months ago uh, to talk about wedding venues and wedding events and churches and things. Right. And uh, after that, we were completely un- a snowball went boom inundated. And uh, all the wardens, all the churches across the UK, state, the UK started uploading their churches on Snowball. Right. Uh, so yes, you if it's not on, and I said if it's not on there, you can simply add it. It's really easy to do. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but there are religious venues on there, of course. Yeah, yeah. I just thought you know that would be a really low hanging fruit for a lot of religious locations, actually. Yeah. Um, and a lot of churches are becoming more accessible. I mean, these are eight, nine hundred year old buildings, especially yeah, in the But a lot of them are quite flat, aren't they? So they wouldn't be too yeah. hard, perhaps, to adapt. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's uh, interesting. So they are getting access. Yeah. So um, what about investment? What do you, you know, how are you funding this, um, Simon? Uh, <laughs> primarily myself at the moment. However, the money won from Santander was great. Um, that was a national award. Um, we we have we had a meeting this week actually with a person from New York who look, who's potentially looking to invest. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I said to myself, we were not going to make a profit for the first three years. Mm-hmm. Okay, and we're about a year and a half in. Um, and but now we've got businesses literally waiting to start the membership scheme. Um, so when pe- when businesses join the membership scheme, it starts off at two hundred. It starts off two hundred fifty pound, depending on the size of the business. Um, so if you're a HSBC or you're a Santander or you're a Subway or a McDonald's, if you're a standard high street shop, it's probably going to be two hundred fifty quid for the assessments. And as I said, we've got dozens of businesses chains waiting to sign up to us, which is great. So we're starting that in a few months. So when that kicks off with the assessors that's going to fund a lot of it um and then eventually we're going to start selling data to businesses as well uh, and that's the other way we're going to be funding it as well so do you have a you know cto a chief tech person uh so at the moment it's external i do want i desperately want to bring it in-house okay i use a very good company called b for b who are based in bournemouth Mm -hmm. um, and they manage the daily operation of the app uh, and the storage of data and everything else. Um, and then uh, for uh, the website, which we're building at the moment and everything else, uh, I use a company called Equal Reach who use uh, forced refugees uh, in Bali, in Somalia, in Kenya and Ethiopia. And it's uh, we're supporting them to get work and stuff. And they're doing work for us all over the world um, in UN refugee camps. Mm. So. But if you're really looking at scalability, I mean, often um, online offerings don't make money for years, do they? Um, in no, terms that, of scalability, that, yeah. so it depends what you go for. If you're going for real international scalability, which may be what the US approach might be. Absolutely. I mean, having, I'd love it. Don't get me wrong. I would love an angel investor. <laughs> 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 come along give me money sell it yes you know have 20 percent of it um but we are it is scaling up very quickly and um google have told me and microsoft have told me as well um uh, google said that if you get two hundred thousand reviews then we'll start talking about potential investment um what that looks like i have no idea whatsoever mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was an open, and honest conversation a few months ago. I haven't really spoken to them since. Microsoft, I kept in contact with a long time because I went down to Microsoft HQ in London. Uh, they were extremely interested in this. However, they've, I think they've kind of moved on to something else to do with AI, uh, not by means on the snowball thing, uh, just uh, integrative, integrative assistive tech. Um, but the people I know there have moved on to something else now, moved departments, so I've kind of lost track with them now. Uh, I mean, because uh, I could see that you could AI empower what you're doing already, couldn't you? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consistent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a question of incorporating AI to it in the future as well, because there are many avenues we can go down. And once we do start, I mean, you have to remember we've done no advertising on this at all, um, only on social, uh, only on Snowball communities. Facebook pages and social media pages. And so if we're getting the traction now of what we're getting and we've done no advertising, this is purely organic. Imagine what it's going to be like when we start TV advertising and radio advertising and glo- and social media advertising. Yeah. And yeah. the yeah. nature of it though may always be quite organic. 
um, you know, you may not need so much. No, uh, uh, that's what we're thinking as well, because uh, word of mouth has taken it so far so f at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and it's sort and of so maintaining the well. integrity for the time being, at least, of exactly what you're attempting to do, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Because there's always a yeah. compromise when you start to get investors in who have different, I mean, they may sign up to the sort of social, you know, the governance and social aspects of it, but, you know, they may also have some different pressures themselves in terms of money raising and, you know, profit making. I mean, I've never seen a Facebook advert <laughs> promoting a Facebook service, you know, you don't see it, do you? Um, you see them, what they provide, like the Facebook portals where they sell them at Christmas and stuff, but that's pretty much it. Uh, everything when it started was word of mouth. And it grew very quickly. Yeah, around the you're university. absolutely right. That organic kind of growth. Yeah. So tell us a bit about your experience with Facebook, because that's quite a remarkable thing, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, we kept talking of Facebook. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, <laughs> So when it was called Ability Access, uh, obviously it's now Snowball. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was quite a fun, actually. Um, I they, they banned the page. They stopped being able to, yeah. Um, I, I didn't understand why. I had no idea why they stopped the page. I went on it one morning to check all the stats and stuff, and it was not there. And I was like, what's going on? And so I arranged a call with one of their marketing experts. And me being a journalist at the time, um, qual newly qualified journalist, I thought, right, uh, I, I didn't initially intend to record the conversation. Um, so what happened was that I started a conversation and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And she said to me, disability is disturbing. People don't want to see disability on Facebook. Okay. That's what she said to me. Now, I'm a newly qualified journalist. I'm running a Facebook page, which is surrounded by disability, which is based from is is this is a bit huge disability page at this time, and I I've got my uh, recorder next to me, my journalist journalism recorder, uh, dictaphone, and I'm just wondering if I can get her to say it again, mm -hmm. and I'm, and so I'm, I and then I realise I turn it on the batteries aren't working, so I'm fiddling around with it, changing the batteries, <laughs> um. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you just, can you say that again, please? And this is when I started recording the conversation and she said it again. She said, you, you have to see it like this. People don't want to see disability. Disability is disturbing. You'd have to see it like this. Um, and I was like, wow. And I was like, it's not disturbing. It's a fact of life. Uh, the conversation went on for about four minutes. Yes. Um, and I, I couldn't believe what I had as a journalist. I mean, I, I mean, I've only been a journalist for five minutes. You know, I graduated in 2018. This is early 2019. Um, and I've got global news. And I know I've got global news. Okay. So I call a friend of mine who works at the BBC, uh, is a, a BBC World News, BBC producer. And within a couple of hours on Radio 5 Live, um, if you Google Facebook Simon Sansom, it comes upon thousands, if not millions of sites. And the news went global very quickly as you can imagine um this is uh facebook effectively saying people don't want to see disabilities you know you got you know they you know they support the paralympic games invictus games it's you know this is global news mm -hmm. um and yeah it it got really big really quickly from tv interviews to newspaper interviews to millions of you know the facebook page just exploded completely and um, it, it, that's what actually uh, that's what actually propelled Snowball Community, where, where Snowball Community was really born. Okay, because beforehand it was ability access, but now I've got a global page. Okay, uh, where people are where millions of people are visiting every every month because of what Facebook said. Uh, but at the time, it was a crazy situation because we had protests outside Facebook HQs. And they were calling themselves, are we disturbing you, Facebook? And they had MPs down there giving speeches. We had campaigners down there giving speeches. I got invited down, but I didn't go down because I didn't know who these people were. And my, my part was done. I didn't want to get involved in that, that part. Um, but it's, it apparently, from what I was told, it was only the second time that uh, Facebook put out a global apology. Goodness. Um, well, you know, so you sort of wish it never happened, but thank goodness that you were able to draw that to everybody's attention. Um, so it was uh, actually dealt with. Could you imagine how long that must have been going on? Yeah. And, and so they've, they clearly highlighted it. And then because then what 
what was quite interesting is is I got an e- because of what happened I got an email I could send if I had ever had any issues and their analytics behind you know the algorithms and stuff uh, banned the page again for a couple of hours because it picked up on it <laughs> <laughs> so I emailed them saying guess what it's happened again <laughs> and within you know 20 minutes of sending that email it was fine again <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. I think I think I I don't think it was actually a person who banned it. I think the algorithm picked up on stuff that wasn't what they they might have said was untowards that. Yeah, uh, so I don't, I don't think it was an actual person who stopped it. It was the tech that stopped it. Well, if I was you, um, I would be um, calling it Facebook to ask for investment. <laughs> well, you say, investors. <laughs> well, you you say that actually. We have been having emails. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying they're going to invest by any means whatsoever. Um, however, we have had emails with the office of Facebook. Um, yeah, we, it hasn't really gone much further than that at the moment, but I'm hoping to uh, ignite, spark an interest from them. But we are there have been correspondence to uh, a very very senior member of the Facebook he- HQ team. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine yes. that would be a good end to that particular part of that story. So yeah. can you tell us just briefly about the role of any sort of um, Paralympian athletes or celebrities perhaps in yeah. promoting snowball? Yeah. Have they been helpful? Yeah, uh, no, very much so. Uh, so Hannah Cockcroft is the most successful British Paralympian of all time. She's one of our ambassadors. She appears in the adverts. Aaron Phipps uh, is a wheelchair rugby player who won gold at Tokyo uh, there. And they are appearing in our... Um, social media ads, which we've been putting out there, which is just, again, organic. We've just been sharing it on our Facebook pages. Yeah. And we filmed this at uh, Bright, uh, Southampton University. Mm. And, we had to, and coincidentally, we actually filmed two adverts, which are completely identical. Um, and the, the reason for this is we filmed one with their Team GB outfits. And I can't show that publicly. I can show it privately, yeah, in small groups. But I can't show that publicly because we don't have the rights yet to the Team GB <laughs> team outfits. Oh yeah, of course okay. they want to sell their sponsorship. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, we need to. Yeah. So uh, we were when we were filming where we are. We are in talks with them. Yeah. Uh, and then we filmed one just in their gym kits, mm-hmm. uh, which isn't quite as effective, but it does the same job. And yeah, well, and it's kind of cool time, actually. That's very authentic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um i know they they are really excited to be involved they they promote it on their social media feeds they talk about it all the time and all their friends talk about it all the time you know whenever they go out and about to competitions they promote it hannah's sharing it all the time hannah's uh partner is uh nathan he's uh, also a paralympian uh one of you got gold and silver medals yeah. and uh he's becoming a snowball ambassador slash uh assessor um uh which he's getting trained up on because he wants to do it in his local area. Um, so it's a family event, which is quite nice. And they are desperately trying to promote it and trying to get people involved, and they're doing a great job of it. So it's nice to have them on board. It's nice for them to be enthusiastic. I think Hannah's going to become a dame, which will be quite cool, because if she wins it uh, in Paris, I think I mean, it's only about time she gets one. She's won, like, you know, t- 10 gold medals. I think she deserves a damehood yeah. uh, or, you know, House of Lords. Mm. Um and hopefully Aaron win another gold at, gold at Paris as well with wheelchair rugby. So that'd be really fantastic. But no, this it's really nice to have them part of the snowball team. Uh, we're looking to do more advertisement with them, more work with them. Um, we just obviously waiting for that bit of funding and investments. But the advert's fun. Uh, we spent four hours filming in uh, in the university, and the, um, every time they say snowball, I throw uh, someone throws snowballs at them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that was me. And so for four hours, I was throwing snowballs at the heads. That's and I thought great. that was quite funny. That's great. Um, so I, yeah. it's going to be really interesting if you're going to be assessing the accessibility and so on of um, the facilities around the Paris Olympics and the Paralympics. Yes. That's going to be interesting, isn't it? Yeah, we, we are going. Yeah, we are. We are going to the uh, Paralympics. We're going to assess loads of hotels and businesses around there. We're going to promote it as much as we can around there. And yeah, we're going to drive over to Paris and stop in a hotel for about a week and do lots of promotions for it. So, yeah. And also the Commonwealth Games, of course, also has um, para sections. And there was um, Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, I think. That was a very successful one. 
But the one in Melbourne has been called off, and I think we're not yet clear where the next Commonwealth Games are going to be. But I hope you'll. No, I, I mean, I mean, I, I'm hoping they're going to be in the UK because then I can go to that city and do lots of promotion there, yeah, of course. Yes, yeah. um, but then again, I would have been happy to travel to Melbourne. You know, I'm not. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, we're all disappointed <laughs> it's not happening in Melbourne. But, yeah. So, um, um, but no, I'm. That's really Sorry, great, Simon. So, I mean, where do you see Snowball in five years' time, just as a sort of, to conclude this? <laughs> the way it's going organically, I honestly think it's going to be one of the biggest apps in the world. I think it's going to be on par with TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor at the moment is worth about four billion quid. And when I looked at how that started compared to where we started, we're pretty much on par. And so I do see this being a, a global app, not just in the UK, but used all around the world. One in five people in the world are uh, have a disability, whether it's a mental health issue, physical disability, learning disability. And I think as soon as we start the membership schemes and businesses start realising that they're not fully equipped and fully disabled and the money they're missing out on. I mean, you've got to remember, money is the biggest drive for businesses. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, the money they're missing out on, I mean, in the UK alone is... £274 billion a year, so trillions across the world, um, just because people can't get over a threshold for your business is absolutely ridiculous. So I think this is going to be a, oh, I hope it's going to be a super phenomenon that people are going to use. Someone's going to give me half a billion quid for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, turn it into a a, a movement. Um to empower and improve the quality of life of millions of people around the world. That's what I want it to be. Yes. Well, I wish you every success and I hope this will be a continuing conversation, Simon. You know, it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to tracking the progress of um, Snowball because I'm sure it will snowball. So um... <laughs> That's why we called it Snowball because bet, the more people use it, the, better, yeah, the more yeah. people use it, the better it is. <laughs> yeah, and also the concept of just throwing a snowball that leads to so many other things, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much. And it was really an inspiring and enlightening discussion. And there's so many areas which you're impacting where so much progress is needed. And, you know, as we heard, I think there's over a billion people in the world with disabilities. And it's a consumer market, which I understand is some say it's worth at least eight trillion US dollars in spending power. So providing accessibility is not just a good thing for people and generally but also for business um, it, it's going to make everybody more money as well as making everybody's lives better and apparently 71 percent of people with disabilities say they would travel more if there were no accessibility barriers according to research commissioned by open doors organization and i think some of the um, some commonwealth countries like the uk canada australia new zealand have got legislation to mandate accessibility standards in public spaces and transport. But as we've heard from you, Simon, actually, you know, even with legislation, that isn't always that effective, is it? But there's a lot of other countries which, you know, are some way behind in that. And they're probably going to be relying more on the private sector, I would think, um, to provide access to um, uh, disabled people. Um, and I think this kind of assistive technology is going to really change people's lives and it's just going to get better and better with AI, audio guides, wayfinding apps, um, everybody's lives and travel should get easier. Thank you everyone who's joined and thank you in particular Simon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.